thank you all for coming back from coffee. I, I know the conversations are very interesting, um, but um, we are going to have an opportunity to all talk to one another later this evening. And uh, so I think it would be great if we can start with the program. Um, we've got a little bit of time here, so I won't have to be quite so draconian with cutting off the questions, which I'm sorry um, we did, but there will be ample opportunity and perhaps if, if you want, we can get some of the earlier speakers back for a couple of more questions after the end of, of our pair of speakers today. But before I invite our first speaker up, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you about a recent gift to the National Gallery of Art. The name Robert Feller will be well known to many of you in the audience. Bob was the Mellon scientist who worked to support the, the gallery's mission in preserving the, the nation's collection. And I, I must confess I forget exactly when he started, but it was in the 1950s. Uh, for those of you who know uh, Bob's work, it's been very important in establishing some of the foundation work for our efforts and our lines of inquiry today. His work on pigments, on stability of pigments, light fading, varnishes, uh, cleaning, and in fact a little bit on the history of color are all, uh, all exemplary. Uh, Bob is a charming man, um, impeccable in his uh, demeanor and uh, a very generous person. What you may not know is that Bob was an inveterate book collector. In describing how he collected books, he chose anything that had the words pigment or color or paint in the title. This way he amassed a collection of over 2,000 volumes. And Herningsworld knew about this collection from very um, early on and was instrumental in working with Bob to facilitate the donation to the National Gallery of Art. And the collection was recently just finalized in its cataloging and is now available in the stacks at the National Gallery of Art, aside from the 200 rare volumes. Upstairs on the um, registration table, you'll see these little cards. Um, the cards have been designed with the book plate that Bob himself created. Uh, he made the drawing of the uh, donkey cart when he was in Rome with his wife, Ruth Johnstonfeller, herself a very important uh, person in our field. The library has arranged a small exhibit in the library at the National Gallery of Art, pulling a few um, of the volumes that represent the deeper holdings in the, in the gallery's collections, and they're opened and uh, explore pigments, painting on glass, uh, and uh, t various technological innovations related to the kinds of things that we study. So if you get a chance, I would encourage you all to go down, perhaps at lunchtime tomorrow, to this small exhibition, which is in the library, which is behind the desk that, that um, is the gatekeeper for the administrative uh, tower in the East Building of the National Gallery of Art. And I should tell you that all the books that are not uh, rare books are cataloged and can be borrowed through interlibrary loan, which is a tremendous resource for us. And I think Bob would be thrilled to know that you might be taking advantage of that. So um, I'd like to, uh, our program will have only two speakers and then as I mentioned before, we'll have some administrative uh, news at the end of that. Our first speaker this afternoon is Lori Wong. Lori is a wall paintings conservator. She is a graduate of Courtauld Institute of Art's Conservation of Wall Paintings program. She has been working as a project specialist at the Getty Conservation Institute since 2002. She's been working on projects in China, at the Mogao Grottos, and in, I don't know how to say this, Chengde? in Egypt on the Valley of the Queens and the Tut of Tutankhamun projects, and in Morocco at the Kasbah, the Tower in Morocco, which all sounds very exciting. She is going to be talking today, um, like presenting a paper which is co-authored with Giovanni Veri and Giacomo Chiari, and the title of the paper is The Use of Portable Non-Invasive Instrumentation for the Study of Wall Paintings in the Tomb of Tutankhamun. So, Laurie. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Barbara. And I um, want to add my thanks to the conference organizers, um, to Tierna, to Chris, to Austin. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I really appreciate being given this opportunity to give you all um, a brief overview of the non-invasive investigation that was undertaken on the wall paintings in the Tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, this work was part of a, a larger collaboration between Egypt's Ministry of State for Antiquities and the Getty Conservation Institute to develop and implement a conservation plan um, for the entire tomb. Um, now, for any of you who have worked in Egypt or who know people who have worked in Egypt, you will know that it is um, very difficult to take samples. The Egyptian authorities uh, have placed restrictions on sampling, um, and this is not necessarily a bad thing that they've done this. Um, it can take months to obtain the necessary permissions, and it's for this reason that even though we were very lucky to eventually be granted permission to take a few samples, um, we did have to limit the number and um, this is another reason why we placed so much emphasis on the non-invasive examination of the paintings. So in this talk today, I will be focusing on examples that relate to painting technology, um, some aspects of past treatment, past restorations, um, past um, even some condition, if I have time, um, that we looked at using non-invasive, non-destructive examination techniques that include microscopy, um, technical imaging, x-ray fluorescence, um, x-ray diffraction. And this is a very good opportunity before I start to acknowledge my co-authors, um, since we're all pictured here on this slide. Um, Giovanni Veri, um, pictured here, who led the technical imaging, and then Giacomo Chiari, who I think is probably familiar to many of you, who undertook the XRD and the XRF analysis. And I'm sorry that they're not here today because um, I really admired the conservator scientist talk that happened earlier today. Um, so I hope to be able to do them justice um, on my own. Now I wanna just give you um, a brief overview of the instrumentation that was used. Um, we undertook um, XRD um, with this in situ duetto. It's a combined XRD, XRF instrument. Um, we also did X-ray fluorescence with a Brooker tracer. Um, and we undertook a lot of in situ microscopy with this handheld USB um, microscope. It's produced by Dynalite. Um, and I, I, at this point, want to mention that for those of you who, um, who work on sites, who, who work in the field, um, but there are many important issues that we have to consider, consider um, when we do non-invasive work. Um, one issue has to do with portability. We have to get all of our equipment to places. Um, sometimes they're quite far away. Um, there's also the ability of this instrumentation to work in quite difficult conditions, difficult environments. The Tomb of Tutankhamun is um, it's very dusty. Um, it's also very hot at certain times of the year. And so this condition, um, these conditions are very harsh, and in fact, uh, Duetto um, suffered from severe heat exhaustion after a few days in the tomb and actually um, stopped working, so. Now the technical imaging, the te technical imaging was undertaken using a uh, Fuji camera that had its UV IR blocking filter removed. Um, the type of imaging that was uh, undertaken, you've heard already some of this mentioned in earlier talks. Um, we did um, visible, infrared reflected. Um, from the infrared reflected, we did false color imaging. We did ultraviolet reflected, um, as well as visible induced luminescence. Um, this was shown earlier today. And this is a technique that Giovanni is shown doing here below. Um, that is specifically to, to image Egyptian blue, and I'll be showing examples of that. Um, and then finally, ultraviolet induced luminescence. Um, and this picture here shows us doing some of the ultraviolet um, photography. And then finally, I'll just mention that calibration was done, uh, was undertaken using um, these Spectralon targets um, as reference standards. And I'm not gonna go into any detail about how we did uh, any of these, um, how we did this imaging, just, for, um, just to save on time. If you have questions, I can talk with you later. So I want to give just a brief introduction to the tomb, and I, I know I, I probably don't have to do this because everybody has heard of the Tomb of Tutankhamun, um, but I'll just give some, just some background. The tomb is located in the Valley of the Kings, 
Um, this is on the west bank of the River Nile. It's in the ancient necropolis of Thebes, which is present-day Luxor. The tomb and its treasures were famously discovered by this man here, British archaeologist Howard Carter in 1922. And this pretty much sealed its fate as one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. But the tomb itself is actually quite modest. It is one of the smallest tombs in the valley. It has only four chambers. And the tomb was actually never completed. So if you can see from these pictures, only the burial chamber, which is located right here, only the burial chamber was decorated with paintings. The rest of the tomb's rock cut, rock cut, excuse me, rock cut walls were left there, as you can see in those pictures. The unfinished state of the tomb, which is strikingly different from other tombs in the valley, other royal tombs in the valley, and for any of you who've been to the Valley of the Kings, you'll know this. Um, this is thought to be a consequence of the young pharaoh's early death, his relatively short reign. He reigned for only 10 years. He died around the age of 18. And the necessary hasty adaptation of a pre-existing tomb that was already under construction. So basically, most people believe that Tutankhamun is not buried in his tomb that was originally started for him. Um, I also want to talk to you a little bit about the wall paintings. Um, I always like to know a little bit about the paintings before delving into um, like small little details of the painting. Um, so the wall paintings in the burial chamber, uh, which you see here, were immediately dismissed by Carter when he saw them. He described them, and I will quote to you, he called them rough, conventional, and severely simple. So as a wall painting conservator, we're, we're um, um, not very happy with this opinion. Um, his comments have, quite surprisingly, they've never been challenged um, since the tomb's discovery, and the paintings have therefore been little, very little studied, they've been largely ignored, so this here today is my small attempt to rewrite history uh, to try to convince all of you that these paintings are actually extremely interesting. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the subject matter. Um, oh, excuse me. So the paintings were meant to be read uh, counterclockwise, starting from the east wall and moving around to the south wall. So on the east wall, you have the mummy of Tutankhamun that lies in the shrine, and it's being pulled on the sledge by a group of 12 uh, officials in mourning. Um, on the north wall, you actually have three scenes here, but I'm just gonna focus in on a couple. Um, this scene here is arguably one of the most important scenes within the uh, burial chamber. It shows Tutankhamun's successor. This is the pharaoh Ai. Um, he is shown performing this opening of the mouth ceremony. So he's got this strange little implement he's holding. And he holds it before Tutankhamun, who is pictured in the form of Osiris. And Osiris is the god of the underworld. So this scene is important because it's interpreted as Ai's influence in preparing the tomb and his use of these wall paintings to legitimize his succession over Tutankhamun. Um, here we have um, Tutankhamun pictured as a living king. Behind him stands his, his spirit double, his Ka, um, and he's being, he's being embraced by Osiris, the god of the underworld. Um, and then finally here we have um, these famous um, blue baboon deities, uh, which many of you have probably seen. There are 12 of these. They represent the 12 hours of the night through which the sun must travel um, before its rebirth at dawn. Um, and then here, the final wall, you have Tutankhamun again pictured with um, various deities. So the technology of these wall paintings um, were studied very carefully. We looked at, um, we wanted to get a sense of the layer stratigraphy. And so we basically, starting from the rock cut limestone support, we looked at the plaster layers, preparatory layers, ground layers, and then the paint layers. Um, and in order to do this, we relied heavily on a handheld microscope that I showed earlier to investigate the layers. Um, this table that I show here, it, it sums up the results of these different layers, and it does it um, by wall. And I'm not expecting you to absorb this table. Um, it's, it's, it's here to basically serve one purpose, um, which is to show you that each wall has a slightly different layer stratigraphy. Um, and this was something that was very surprising to us. Um, we assumed that in a small chamber that we would have um, more consistency in how the paintings were, were actually made. 
Uh, I should note that the paintings, um, given their age, and the paintings are 3,500 years old, are remarkably um, in remarkably good condition as they have very little loss. Um, so I say this because the points of access that allows us um, to see the stratigraphy, they're very limited, um, very limited areas available. So this table that I show here, it combines information obtained from the microscopy, but it was also later confirmed um, once we were able to take samples. Okay, now onto the rock cut walls. Um, the plaster was applied, and I have to stress that I'm talking about wall paintings on plaster. It's very different from um, a lot of the canvas paintings that we've been looking at. Um, so the first plaster layer um, was a coarse earthen plaster, and this was a leveling layer, and it was applied to the rock um, to level irregular rock surfaces, to fill cracks um, and faults in the rock. This was then followed by a buff-colored earthen fine plaster. And the thickness of this plaster layer, um, and this plaster layer is on all walls, whereas this is only in certain areas where you have voids to fill. Um, the thickness of this layer varied quite considerably, and you can see this from the two examples I show. Here it's obviously a bit thicker. Um, this example here shows the plaster, and it's extremely thin. It's applied as a very thin <coughs> wash. Um, and then the third plaster layer is um, this gray plaster that I show here. And this gray plaster is sporadically used. Um, and because it is sporadically used, we um, think that its main function was as a repair material. The largest area is um, this area here on the south wall. And you can see the patches here delineated. Um, there was clearly some problem with the original plastering on this wall that required uh, quite substantial repairing to happen here. And they did so with this gray material. So if we look at this small area here, um, we looked at it with our microscope. Um, you can see that buff-colored plaster I showed earlier, and then on top of it, there is this gray-colored plaster. Um, so we looked at these two plasters with XRF and found calcite and anchorite in the, the buff-colored plaster, and then gypsum and anhydrite in the gray plaster. The buff-colored plaster was actually uh, confirmed as an earth-containing plaster um, later on through um, analysis of samples obtained. But this finding is actually quite interesting because it is contrary to what is generally written about Egyptian plasters. Um, a lot of um, sources basically write that Egyptian plasters are uh, assumed to be gypsum containing. And in this case, we obviously, we have both earth containing and gypsum containing plasters. Onto the plaster layer, we have um, an additional layer, which we've been calling this preparatory layer. Um, it's basically a very thin wash of plaster. And on three of the walls, on the south, east, and west walls, this plaster layer was brushed on um, with a thin buff-colored wash. And it was um, most likely applied as almost like a liquid. Um, and you see this here. On the north wall, though, we have a very different gray wash. Um, and this uniquely covers the entire wall. Um, and it was also applied by brush. And it, as you can see here, it overlaps um, onto the west wall. This is the northwest corner of the burial chamber. Um, you can also see in this um, image taken this, um, with our microscope, you can see what this gray pre preparatory wash looks like, and you can see how it overlaps this buff-colored um, wash here. Okay, the next layer we have is the ground. Um, there was a white ground that was applied as a uniform layer on the northeast and west walls. So it was applied on three of the walls. Um, but for some reason, on the south wall, the ground layer is just completely omitted. Um, and the paintings are instead executed directly onto the preparatory layer that I showed previously. This image that I show here, this is an image um, from the base of the north wall. So basically, the painting um, stops at this black line. Um, but you can see that the white ground extends below the painted zone. And in fact, there's drip marks here. Um, so it's, it really gives us the impression that the ground was applied in a hurry. It was just kind of um, applied very quickly. Um, the ground was identified as huntite by XRF. Um, and when we were able to take samples, we were also able to confirm the presence of the ground in cross-section. Um, huntite is magnesium calcium carbonate, so we were able to use um, magnesium as a marker. So in the elemental map for magnesium, you can see this is the ground layer here. 
Um, and in fact, you have uh, huntite also appearing in the paint layer because this is a sample of blue um, from the baboons that was mixed with huntite to produce a light blue. Um, and I will just point out the yellow layer here because it's something that I'm going to be touching on again. Um, this is another example for the north wall, and again, it's right at that line where the painting uh, stops. So we imaged this area here. Um, this is the image in visible light, um, and then this is it with this visible-induced luminescence imaging. Um, and what's interesting here is that you can see the presence of uh, Egyptian blue particles. Um, we've heard this already. Um, so every area that contains Egyptian blue, so even single crystals, are clearly visible as this bright white uh, area. So the white luminescence that you see um, is here. This is the area of the foot. Um, interestingly, you also see it in the black band, um, but you do not see anything below the black band. So this addition of blue, as um, David mentioned this morning, um, this is something that we've seen um, blue being added to white to make a brighter white. Um, so we see it only in the painted area here on the area of the foot, um, but we do not see it added to the ground. And this does make some sense because the ground was never meant to be visible. Um, so another thing we notice is that there's quite even distribution of the Egyptian blue particles. So this shows that this was an intentional addition um, and also that the blue particles were well mixed into the white. Um, this is an image that was taken with our microscope, and you can see we could, we could easily see these uh, Egyptian blue um, particles visible. So blue was added to white, um, but it was also added to other pigments, such as um, the flesh colors of the figures. Um, so this is the image of Tutankhamun, his ka. So there was Egyptian blue mixed into the red. Um, and this slide also shows what I had showed um, previously, that yellow, that yellow um, layer in the baboon cross-section. So the um, burial chamber is obviously a very important part of the tomb. Um, and in the case of Tutankhamun, the walls are painted yellow because it was meant to symbolize um, a house of gold. Um, so XRF analysis of the yellow identified iron and identified some calcium, and XRD identified um, the mineral grotite, or yellow ochre. Uh, XRD also found quartz, calcite, and gypsum, which could be present as um, impurities in, in the natural ochre. So interestingly, this yellow background, it underlies all painting on three walls, on the south, east, and west walls. So after the ground was applied, the entire wall was painted yellow, and then the um, the figures and subject matter was painted on top of the yellow, which is why we see the yellow in all the cross sections. Um, but on the north wall, the yellow was instead painted, um, it, was, it was applied later, after the figures were already blocked out. And so the yellow does not extend across the entire wall. And you can see that in this detail here. You can see that the yellow is actually applied on top of the red and was painted around this figure. Um, and again, later when we were able to take samples, we confirmed this. So um, all the samples from the east and the west and the south walls show the presence of this yellow background, whereas any sample from the north wall completely omits this yellow background. So if we look at the different setting out um, methods that were used throughout the burial chamber to lay out the paintings, um, what we have are snap lines. You can see the splatter of this red ochre here and here. Um, there's also red ochre that was used um, to kind of roughly mark out areas such as the shoulder of this figure, the tail of this baboon. Um, but these, um, these methods were only used on certain walls. Um, and then we have the north wall here, which has these incisions, these incisions that were made into wet plaster. And here you see this kind of roughly um, marked out horizontal incision across the shoulder of Tutankhamun, and this was probably done to align all the figures on this wall. Um, and plaster incisions are not found in any, other, um, in any other wall but the north wall. So interestingly, when we um, did some more imaging with the visible-induced luminescence imaging, we can see that Egyptian blue um, appears to have been used to roughly sketch out certain areas of the painting. Um, so you see here, the shoulder is kind of um, 
created to um, created along here. And then the different colored bands are kind of roughly marked out, again, with Egyptian blue. Uh, we can't really say whether this is actually the case, what they were attempting to do, because um, it is still a possibility that the brush that they were using had Egyptian blue on it, and that's just what we're seeing in this image. So we've talked a lot about um, visible induced luminescence imaging and how it shows Egyptian blue, this calcium copper tetrasilicate. Um, and Tutankhamun is no different. Uh, we see it used extensively throughout the burial chamber. I mean, I showed this image just because it's so amazing. This uh, intricate shrine that the mummy of Tutankhamun lies inside, and you can see all the areas of, of, of Egyptian blue. But, you know, Egyptian blue is a very common pigment during this time. Um, and we saw it in the sarcophagus of um, SETI-1. Um, but what is interesting is if we look at if we look at Egyptian green, which we can see here in the hands, um, the face and the hands of Osiris. And Egyptian green as a pure pigment does not show any visible induced luminescence. And we see that here. We see no bright white appearing here. Um, however, we do have some areas where particles of Egyptian blue are actually present in Egyptian green. And this is caused um, as impurities during the manufacturing process. We also have areas where, like on the wigs of these small deities from the west wall, you have areas where um, the color appears green. Um, but clearly, when you look at these images here, the visible induced luminescence images, you can see that it is 100% Egyptian blue. Um, so what we have are we have areas of Egyptian blue that have discolored. Um, they've gone from blue to green. And this is thought to be related to this yellowing or browning um, of the binding media. And this has been written about by um, different authors. Um, so now I'm going to move on and talk a bit about um, some of the restorations that have taken place in the tomb. And I'm going to look at both modern um, as well as ancient restorations. So the wall paintings, I think many people do not know that the wall paintings were actually restored sometime between 1926 and 1935. Um, we know this based on photographic evidence. We have no written information about who did it or where the restorations occurred. The extent of this repainting, which involves um, both replastering and overpainting, um, some areas it's not that obvious, other areas it's very obvious. Um, however, when we use visible induced luminescence and false color infrared imaging, um, these areas can be very clearly visualized and mapped. And this image that I show is, again, of the Ka, Tutankhamun's Ka from the North Wall. And you can clearly see um, that there is a large uh, repair that was put in. It was put in with a blue pigment that is definitely not Egyptian blue. Uh, likewise, on one of the baboons from the West Wall, um, you see all these areas where Egyptian blue is missing. Um, and what's interesting here is if we look at the false color image, you can see that most of these areas um, have the same, are the same type of color, so we can assume that they were probably done at the same time. And this dark appearance in the infrared false color um, could possibly, I mean, it could indicate strong absorption in the infrared range, and it could suggest certain pigments that were used, um, like one pigment could be Prussian blue. Um, it could also exclude um, some pigments, like for instance, ultramarine or smalt. Um, the only exception to the repairs is if we look here at the tail, uh, and it's quite small, I don't know if you can see it here. In the false color image, the color is actually very different uh, from the color that you see here. So we assume that this was perhaps a different time period. Um, that it was um, definitely done with a different, um, different pigment. And our, our current hypothesis is that this was actually an ancient repair, uh, a, a repair that was done in pharaonic times. And we know that there were repairs done during that time. Um, and that this, though it's not Egyptian blue, um, we think it was kind of a false blue, that it was actually a black pigment mixed with um, white to create um, a very similar look um, to the blue of the baboon. Um, here we have another example, uh, which shows the skirt of Tutankhamun on the north wall. 
And you can see quite clearly that there is this um, yellowy, it's more yellow, it appears quite green here, uh, luminescence under UV illumination. So this is clearly um, a restoration. It's possible that this is a, um, a zinc white pigment um, that was used in this one area. And then we also have other examples, like this detail from the north wall. Um, this is, again, UV-induced luminescence imaging. And you see this kind of watery-looking stain. And so this could be an indication of some sort of surface consolidant, um, some sort of treatment material that's on the surface. Uh, and we know from visual observation, as well as um, reports, that various treatments of this nature um, have been undertaken in the tomb. And you can actually, if you could see here, there's actually some injection holes along a very fine crack here. So this gives us a good sense. Um, it, it helps us um, to kind of get a sense of uh, how extensive the treatment has been in the tomb. So I think I will um, conclude here and maybe allow a bit of time for questions. Um, and I just want to say that the non-invasive investigation of the wall paintings in the Tomb of Tutankhamun really gave us um, a very solid base of, of knowledge um, for beginning to understand aspects of painting technology, of previous treatment, um, of condition, and that the results that we gained from this investigation were extremely valuable because we had to really reduce the number of samples that we would probably normally take. And it also helped us to focus um, our sampling on really the most um, outstanding remaining questions that we had um, to conserve these paintings. Um, so I will conclude here, and I thank you so much for your attention.